Are we good? Okay. So, my name is Miguel Morales. Uh, thank you for attending the summer school. I am from Lawrence Livermore National Labs, and I'm going to be talking about wave function optimization during the next hour. So I don't really mind questions. I actually prefer to have a discussion rather than just a one-way uh, one uh, presentation. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to, to ask questions. The worst that could happen is that we either stay long or we have to cut short, depending on what you prefer. Uh, so. So this is an outline of the lecture. I'm gonna say some very basic things about variation of Monte Carlo. By the way, we're, talking, we're gonna talk about optimization algorithms within variation of Monte Carlo. Then I'm gonna talk about cost functions, what you actually optimize, and there are different alternatives. And then I'm gonna actually describe a little bit of the history of the algorithms that have been used in QMC, and then give a brief description of the algorithm that's uh, considered the default algorithm and the one you should be using in QMC pack. And then I'm gonna finalize with some specifics about the code. Uh, um, so this is a, a review of VMC. David already discussed this, but I just want to set up some possibly different notation to be able to use in this lecture. So VMC is not, nothing more than effectively the calculation of matrix elements of operators using specific trial wave functions. One of the benefits of Monte Carlo is that if you can write the wave function, if you can evaluate it on a computer, it doesn't matter how complicated it is. As long as you can evaluate it, you can perform variation of Monte Carlo on it. Uh, effectively, this is the, the, the general idea. We calculate the matrix element of any operator by, uh, with respect to some trial wave function. And we write this in, it, it, VMC is typically done in, in real space, although it can be done in other forms. I restrict, I, I limit the discussion here to real space variation of Monte Carlo, but most of the ideas transfer to, to other spaces as well. So we turn this matrix element into a big integral, basically, uh, which with a little bit of algebra, you can convince yourself that any matrix element like this can be written in this form for the energy, specifically. Uh, effectively, you have a distribution that's defined by the square modulus of your trial wave function normalized, and then you have the, the the local energy, which is what you average over this distribution to get your variational energy. And the local energy is nothing else than the matrix element of the Hamiltonian between the trial wave function and a vector in position space. So R, in this case, is a 3n dimensional vector, three coordinates per every electron. So this becomes a 3n dimensional integral, and we just do straightforward Monte Carlo integration on it. Uh, if we had some, there, there's nothing so special. I mean, once you write it this way, Monte Carlo allows you to do the, the integration. And the benefit, of course, is that as the dimension of the integral becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, Monte Carlo becomes by far the most efficient way to perform these integrals. If, if there was an alternative way that didn't require stochastic integration, then we could equally well do the integration with those methods, but nothing really beats Monte Carlo once the dimensionality of the problem becomes big enough. And big enough is, is not that big. I think beyond six or, or so dimensions, stochastic methods become the way to perform integration more efficiently. David already talked about uh, the, the statistical noise and how to measure the noise, so I'm not gonna say much about that. Uh, but effectively, any calculation of this sort that we do has associated with it stochastic, a stochastic uncertainty, which we can quantify in some, in some well-defined way. The variance of, we, we can, so for the optimization, we're gonna use two pieces. We're gonna use the energy, which is this equation, and the variance. The variance, is, of course, is defined as the matrix element of H minus E squared, and it's a measure of, it's, it's a measure of how good your trial wave function is. If you have a, a true eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, the variance is exactly zero. Uh, so, so this a, a variation of Monte Carlo satisfies what's called the variational principle, which means that it doesn't matter what trial wave function you put, it's always going to be an upper bound to the energy. So, of course, the idea is we want to make the ansatz of the wave function as complicated as we possibly can, and then we want to use standard optimization methods to extract the lowest energy state given the form that we assume from the beginning. I'm going to say more about wave functions a little bit today, and, and tomorrow we're going to go in some depth about wave functions. But for, from the point of view of today, you just assume that this is some sort of ansatz 
and you want to make it as flexible as possible. There are going to be many parameters, hundreds, thousands of parameters that, that then you're going to optimize on. And it also satisfies what's called the zero variance principle, which is what I just defined. If in the limit where your wave function is exact, your variance goes to zero. So if you calculate the variance of any wave function, you get a measure of how good it is based on the magnitude of the variance. So we can optimize wave functions two ways. We can either minimize the energy, because we know that there's a variational principle, and the lower the energy, the better the wave function. Or we can minimize the variance, because we know that the variance going to, when the variance is exactly zero, we get the best, the exact wave function, basically. In practice, we, we do a mixture of the two, as, as I'm going to show. Um, so a little bit about wave function optimization. When I was a student, I remember uh, there was this uh, you know, stigma with wave function optimization. It was considered very hard. It used to be, because there's statistical noise involved, it took the community some years to come up with robust methods on how to do this in a, in a black box way, where you just go, you press enter, and the computer and the algorithm takes care of itself. It used to be very human time consuming. I mean, it would take a lot of babysitting of the calculation, making sure that you would you know, play with the algorithm in such a way that you guarantee that the wave function was optimized as best as it could. Uh, of course, this has gone away to a large degree. We can now, for most cases, it's still not completely robust, but for most cases, we have robust algorithms within QMC Pack, for example, where effectively you just define the answers of your wave function and the algorithm converges very well. Uh, the, the, be the beauty and the benefit of QMC is that, in principle, we can use as complicated a, as a, of a wave function as we can. If you are, for example, if you know a little bit of quantum chemistry, you know that in, in that field, everything is typically done deterministically. And, and the, way, the form of the wave function that they can use is typically restricted to, to single, uh, you know, combinations of single determinants. It's typically very hard to put correlation directly on the wave function, because if you want to do the integral analytically, it becomes a very complicated process. In Monte Carlo, it's, it's, a different, uh, it's, a, it's a different approach. We really want to make the wave function as complicated as we, as we can, and then extract the, the, the most amount of energy by minimization. This, of course, leads to a complicated optimization problem. And as I will try to show, uh, there, it's, it's, it's quite delicate. But there are some methods that have been invented in the last 10 years or so that actually have moved the field uh, quite ahead. Uh, the typical form of a wave function that we use in Monte Carlo is what's called the, it's a product form. Uh, we have an antisymmetric piece. This piece takes, it's antisymmetric under electron exchange. So of course, uh, if you exchange two electrons that are the same spin, the sign changes. And so the entire exchange contribution or the antisymmetry of the wave function is entirely encapsulated into this piece. This could be a single Slater determinant. It could be a linear combination of Slater determinants. It can be an uh, AGP wave function. It, it can be anything effectively that it's antisymmetric. And then we uh, enhance that with, by multiplying by a, what's a correlator factor, which is typically called a Jastrow factor. So effectively, in this case, it's typically written this way. J accounts for direct correlation between 2, 3, 4, 5, any arbitrary number of particles. In practice, of course, the, the more particles you correlate, the more expensive the evaluation becomes. So typ people typically do three-body correlations by default, and you can do four. Uh, there are some groups that do four. Yeah. But effectively, the general form looks like this. So, so the J looks effectively like this. It's just a sum of terms, and every term is a fairly generic correlator. You know, you can correlate one electron at a time. In this case, it would be an electron ion term. Or you can correlate two electrons at a time, or three, and so forth. So each one of these correlators become a completely generic function of one, two, three, or so forth uh, positions. Uh, how you parameterize these forms alter a little bit how the optimization algorithm behaves. Uh, but you can think of this as an unlimited source of variational parameters in some way. And in practice, you, know, you typically get something like 10 or so parameters per, per atom. It can be much more, actually. Uh, so, and, and, and you notice that these parameters are in, in the exponent. So that makes things somewhat complicated. Uh, the other term, which is the antisymmetric 
term. So the parameters here tend to be linear. If you think about a linear combination of Slater determinants, then we can optimize the coefficient in front of every determinant so that we have a set of linear coefficients. We can optimize the orbitals themselves. We typically take orbitals from some mean field type of calculation, like DFT, for example. But you can go ahead and optimize those orbitals if you want. You don't have to stick to them. And you can even go ahead as, as far as optimizing parameters in your atomic basis set, for example. I'm going to discuss atomic basis and, and all of the things uh, that I'm mentioning here tomorrow. From, from today's point of view, these are all pa variation of parameters that we can, in principle, optimize if we decide to. Uh, so like I mentioned before, uh, what it is that we actually optimize? We need an actual function that we are going to, to minimize. In this case, because of the serial variance and the upper bound principle, you can, you can either minimize energy or variance. It's uh, typically, historically, variance was optimized in the beginning because it's a simpler optimization problem. It's, it's, you know, it's positive definite, so you can do, it becomes slightly easier to do in practice. Uh, but in principle, what we really want to minimize is the energy. Lower energy solutions tend to be better. After many years of testing and, and a lot of progress in the field, what typically happens in most codes, and certainly what happens in QMC Park, is you, you have an arbitrary linear combination of the two. So you typically have some amount of energy and some amount of variance, and you get to play. It's completely user dependent, the, the ratio of these two. In practice, for example, I personally always tend to do something like 95% energy and 5% variance. And, and the reason is because even if you optimize the energy, having among the solutions that give you low energy, having the ones that also give you lower variance is a beneficial thing from, from the point of view of errors and also from the point of view of computational yeah, costs. Variance have different units. So how can you say that? I know. <laughs> it's true, but you can still do it. Uh, in principle, these parameters become dimensionless. I mean dimension. Uh, they have dimension. So yeah. from the point of view of the code, you know, you can do it. And what you can do in practice is actually look at the stability of DMC, for example, as a result of, of making different choices. And so in practice, what's usually ideal is to put a little bit of variance just to choose the lower variance solutions among the manifold of states that have lower energy, basically. So it's seen as an added benefit. It, there's nothing too deep theoretically, really. It's just you get better solutions this way. And uh, so like I said, variance minimization is usually more stable, to be honest. But it's typically not the thing that you want to do. Uh, if you want to minimize the energy, it typically requires, uh, as you're going to see, uh, more stochastic sampling. Because the noise influences the energy minimization a little bit more than the variance minimization. But, but in the code, you can do either one. It's up to you. Um, I'm going to go through three uh, optimization algorithms. Sorry. 1150, okay. And, uh, and try to, to progress slowly towards what the actual method in the code is. Uh, the code can actually do steepest descents. If you want, it's just not a very good thing to do. Uh, it's very slowly convergent. So in principle, if you think about it, if you have a function, in this case, the cost function, and you want to minimize it, there are, this is a, com this is a very important field in mathematics, and there are very well-defined ways of doing this. In principle, you can go and just grab any method from the numerical analysis community and implement it here. You either need to, there are methods that require first order derivatives. There are methods that require second order derivatives. There are also methods that require no, no derivatives at all. Those tend to be uh, not, they converge typically very slowly if you don't have derivative information, which we do. So, so we, people haven't really taken into consideration methods that don't require derivatives. The simplest method that you can think of is steepest descent. So if you know the gradient of the function with respect to a variable, you can just walk down the hill, which is exactly what this method is doing. If you, if you can calculate the gradient, which is nothing else than the derivative of the cost function with respect to some one of the many, many parameters in your wave function, evaluated at the actual value of the parameter that you have, then you can just walk down the hill with some magnitude that you can, you can estimate in different ways. So this is, this is a, the simplest method. If you know the gradients, you can just implement steepest descent. The problem is that it's typically very slowly convergent. I don't have a, a drawing of, of why, but this is very well understood. If you have, for example, a, a narrow valley where you have effectively 
to in one direction it uh, basically is not so steep and in the orthogonal direction is very steep instead of walking along the steepest uh, the direction you're going to be basically oscillating on the very steep direction and not walking at all on the slow decreasing direction because it, it will try to always walk along the direction of steepest descent which might be orthogonal to the direction that you want to go. Uh, the, the benefit of steepest descent is that you don't need Hessians, you don't need second derivatives, which can be tricky to evaluate. Uh, so I forgot to do that. So if we set a little bit of notation before we move forward. Um, so the, in this case, when I talk about the gradient and the Hessian, I'm talking about the gradient and the Hessian of the cost function. So whatever decision you make here about what your actual cost function would be, it would be a derivative of the energy or a derivative of the variance or a linear combination. So, so you decide what your cost function is, and then the code can actually go ahead and for whatever parameters your trial wave function has. Remember, it can be parameters in the just row, it can be parameters in the determinant. Whatever set of parameters your wave function has, you need to evaluate first order derivatives of the cost function with respect to those parameters, or you get to evaluate second order derivatives, which, which are the Hessian. So in, in any case, at the end of the day, regardless of which of the two you end up using, you're going to require, you can reformulate these quantities in, in terms of the derivatives of the wave function with respect to the actual parameter, and the second, and the, basically the second derivatives of the wave function with respect to the parameters. I'm going to give some formulas on this uh, in some slides further down, but it's, it's not so critical what the actual formula is. It just, what matters is that in, in, in the code, we can evaluate these things and we get to decide which algorithm we use depending. So, so for example, if we only are able to evaluate this quantity, then we can do steepest descent. But like I said, it's not the, the best, it's not the ideal case. Of course, you can go further. If you can actually evaluate the Hessian, Newton's method is a, a good thing to do. Uh, it converges quadratically when you're close to the minimum. And, uh, and effectively, this is, what, this is what the method looks like. Now, you effectively uh, move based on, you assume that you have a quadratic expansion of your uh, cost function around your current position. And you basically take a quadratic step to the, you, you take an exact solution assuming this para quadratic parametrization. And this is what it boils down to. You need to know your gradient and your Hessian now. So this, this method is typically quite efficient. Uh, the problem is that, of course, now you have to evaluate Hessians, which is quadratic on your number of, of variables. And, uh, and the evaluation of the Hessian is noisy. So this is not the method that people tend to use. But in practice, it's implemented in many codes, and, and, and it, it can be used. Uh, the typical problem is that implementing the cross terms is hard. So if you have a parameter way on your gesture and another parameter deep in your orbital, in your anti-symmetric piece, getting those cross, uh, cross derivatives from a coding point of view can, can become complicated. Uh, so we tend not to use this. What we actually do, in, in fact, what we suggest we do in the code is what's called the linear method. So the linear method is something that was developed, so, well, I can say recently, but every time I do this, a few years have gone by. So, so this was really developed around 2007, which, for me, it's actually somewhat recent. Uh, so th the idea is, is it's quite interesting, actually. So instead of trying to get uh, traditional optimization methods from mathematics, uh, the idea is now, let's assume that you have a wave function, uh, any wave function. It doesn't really matter what it is. And let's assume that we do a linear expansion on the actual derivatives of the wave function. So, so this is more like doing Krilov uh, optimization, for example. You can show that you're effectively optimizing within the first order derivatives of your space around the point where you are. So to make that, uh, to say that again, if we take our wave function and we consider a generalized wave function, which is a basically leaves on the space of linear derivatives. So we, we take the wave function with the parameters that we have, and then we consider arbitrary displacements along the first order derivatives of the wave function. If we remember, this psi i bar is nothing else than the derivative of psi with respect to some parameter. So the, the bar now comes from the fact that we orthogonalize now the derivative. So we consider the derivative, and we orthogonalize it to the location where we are right now. We take the, the, the actual gradient, 
and we remove the component al along size zero. So effectively, this becomes an orthogonal space uh, parameterized by first order derivatives. This is exactly the same as the Krylov subspace, if you, if you know about Krylov methods. And so once you have this uh, linear space, you can actually solve uh, the eigenvalue problem within this linear space. And this would give you effectively this eigenvalue equation, where h bar is the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian among these uh, orthogonalized first order derivatives. And S is just the overlap matrix. So once you solve this eigenvalue problem, this gives you this set of uh, the direction on, on this space that minimizes the energy within this subspace. Of course, this is linear. And m almost all of the parameters in the wave function would be highly nonlinear. So this would, this would be only accurate in the neighborhood of your current location. And it only allows you, effectively, it gives you a direction along which, if you move, you're going to find uh, a decrease in energy. Uh, this, is, this is typically a, a good way of solving either very large eigenvalue problems, or you can solve highly nonlinear problems this way fairly efficiently. So the big benefit is that you can show that this method actually converges quadratically, close to quadratically, and you don't actually need Hessians. The only thing that you evaluate are matrix elements of the Hamiltonian among uh, first order derivatives of the wave function, which is different as taking the second order derivative of the Hamiltonian itself. Uh, I'm not sure if this is too relevant. For those of you who are curious and interested, uh, you can, these are the equations for the derivative of the energy with respect to an arbitrary parameter. You can show that if you just do the simple uh, mathematics, it's just the derivative of a ratio of integrals. And you can rewrite it this way, where now, of course, the brackets represent averages with respect to the distribution. So instead of, for example, the energy is the average of the local energy, in this case, the gradient is the average of the logarithmic uh, of the ratio of psi, the, the, this is the logarithmic derivative of the wave function, times this uh, effectively the shift between the local energy and its average. You can also take the second derivative, and you can see that it's much more complicated. And it requires second order derivatives of the wave function, which is the thing that we're usually trying to avoid. Um, you, know, you can notice that nowhere. Uh, does the average of the gradient of the local energy appear. So you can show that that is exactly 0 if, uh, but anyway. Um, so in principle, anything that we need to calculate these quantities can be accessed from a standard BMC calculation. Uh, in the linear method now, the, the equations, the, the actual matrices that we use are, are the following. We have the overlap matrix, where we, we take index 0 to mean the value of the wave function, the current value of the wave function, and then i represents uh, matrix elements with respect to a, de uh, to a derivative of the wave function with respect to parameter number uh, i. And, and effectively, the overlap is just you know, the, the product, the covariance matrix of the logarithmic derivative of the wave function. And the Hamiltonian effectively uh, you know, looks like this. So the, in this case, it just looks like, like the gradient. And for the, uh, for the, between two directions, it has this form, which is different products of logarithmic derivatives and local energies. So you can see that nowhere in this expression do we have actual second order derivatives, which is what we wanted from the beginning. You can code second order derivatives. It's just uh, non-trivial from the point of view of, of the code. Uh, you, the way we write the code, we have uh, our wave function is basically a combination of different pieces. And we want each piece to live independent from the other. So if you want to have mixed derivatives, then it makes the coding much more complicated. But this method allows you to effectively optimize with the same speed as the Newton method and, and not require any of the complicated coding. Um, so like I mentioned before, once you solve this linear equation, this is regardless of whether you use steepest descent or the Newton method or the linear method. The only thing that these methods give you is say direction in parameter space. But since the problem is so highly nonlinear, we there is no way to know how far along this direction we have to move to really reach the minimum. You have to solve or you have to find a way to determine how far along you move into this direction uh, every time you, you solve one of these problems. So let's say we take the linear method and we solve the eigenvalue problem. This gives us a direction in parameter space. 
and, and then we have to decide how far along we want to move. There are several approaches. Uh, the code has, I believe, three or four possibilities. Uh, the, the simplest thing, which it's not clear if it converges all the time, is just to fix the, the step by some small amount. Uh, you know, you can make a very small, in the limit, where the time step goes to zero, the method always converges, but it takes longer and longer and longer to converge. So typically, this is not a good idea. And I, I don't even know if this actually is implemented in the code. Uh, the, this, this, the simplest thing that you can think of is if I have a direction, I can go ahead and do a, a one-dimensional line minimization of the energy or of the cost function along this direction. This is typically the most robust way to optimize parameters. So if you're trying to optimize a very complicated wave function that has very different that has parameters in, in very different places, like you're doing a very long multi-determinant and you have a three-body jazz throw, these are parameters that are very nonlinear. So typically you 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 have to do this. You effectively solve a 1D minimization problem doing uh, I believe we got this from like numerical recipes, <laughs> how to do the 1D. Yeah, so, and we do correlated sampling, which I describe in the next section. But effectively, it's, it's a 1D minimisa minimization doing reweighting. There are two other approaches. The, the, you can either, there's a rescaling algorithm by Cyrus Umrigar, who's the person who originally developed the, the, uh, the, the linear method, uh, who's in, what that's implemented. Uh, I'm, I'm not, it's there, I don't really suggest it, because it sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. So to summarize everything, there are really two approaches that I suggest. One is doing direct minimization, and the other one is feeding a quartic, I think it's quartic, function to the energy. So we do three, I mean, we do a certain number of evaluations of the local energy along this one dimensional problem, and we just feed a quartic function. And we look for the minimum of, of this feed, and, and that's how we determine how far along we move. So we're going to see this on the tutorials, I believe. So, And I'm, I'm going to show you how to change uh, the, the two approaches. But effectively, what I'm trying to say is once you, once you determine the direction along which you're going to move, you, haven't really, you have solved only half of the problem. You still need to determine how far along you're going to move along this direction. And you can either do line minimization, or you can feed a, a polynomial and, and, and do these two approaches. The feeding of the polynomial is faster, it only requires four evaluations of the reweighting algorithm, uh, but it doesn't, it's sensitive to, you have to, to tell what's the maximum step size so that it can discretize this step and feed the polynomial, and it's somewhat sensitive to this uh, value. If you, if you want to make it very efficiently, you want to make this step larger, but then it can't fail if your wave function is very complicated, because if the wave function is too nonlinear, you really cannot walk too far away without having the nonlinearity come back into the energy. So the, the safest way is to do line minimization, but then again, it's going to be somewhat expensive. OK, so I, I've mentioned reweighting a few times. So I, I want to put a slide up here describing what reweighting is. But reweighting is a very simple idea from Monte Carlo integration. This is not unique to, to QMC. Uh, reweighting is simply the idea. I'm, I'm, I believe David might have described this already, but I'm just going to say it again in case uh, it hasn't been said. But so typically, if you have a product of two, uh, if you want to perform this integral, you can do this in two ways. You can sample points from G, assuming that G is a normalized distribution, and then the integral would become effectively the average over the samples of G of the f of the value of the f function, and your error is then related to the variance of f. But you can, this, this is not the only choice, because of course we can take any integral and split it into a product of functions in somewhat arbitrary way. We can, define, we can decide that we want a different g, for example. If we want to perform this integral with a slightly different g, uh, you can perform this integral still sh using uh, the sample of points that you obtain to do this integral up here from g, uh, effectively by rewriting the equation on this form. So if I multiply and divide by a slightly different normalized distribution, then this q prime integral, which is the integral of f times g prime, can be written this form using a sample obtained from g, not from g prime. So you effectively, on the integrand, have to renormalize what we call reweight the, the integrand by the ratio of g prime divided by g. 
So in practice, what does this mean? So let's assume that we have a certain parameter set, which we are going to, and then we have the, the distribution, the square modulus of the wave function with respect to a certain, our current set of parameters, and we call that G. If we want to evaluate the energy with a slightly different set of parameters, we would have to resample the wave function, which we are going to call psi prime, which is psi with a slightly different set of parameters. We would have to resample the entire integral to obtain the new energy. What reweighting allows us to do is that instead of having to obtain a new set of samples with the new wave function, we can use the set of samples from the old wave function and correct for the fact that the integral that we really want is the integral with respect to psi prime and not the integral that with respect to psi, the on prime, which is the one with the old set of parameters. So we can recycle the same samples that we used in a, pre in a previous step or that we pre-generated to calculate the energy with a set of, with a wave function that has parameters that are slightly different. And it just means effectively multiplying everything by this ratio of wave functions. The wave function with the new parameters divided by the wave function of the old parameters. You can show that in the limit where G prime becomes close to G, the efficiency, I mean, not in the limit, but effectively the efficiency of the resampling procedure goes like this. So the closer G prime is to G, the more efficient this method becomes. If you try to reweight re with a wave function that's too different from the one that you used to draw the samples, the effective number of samples would drop to zero as effectively these two wave functions become different. So there, there is a, 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 you know, you can, you can use this to calculate very quickly energy differences between two wave functions that are similar, but if, once the wave functions become too different, then the, the method becomes quite inefficient. But once we are doing the line minimization, all we want is to move a little bit in parameter space in such a way that we minimize the energy along this direction. So, so you can show that this method is extremely useful for that. Okay, so if you have questions, I might not be explaining this very well, please ask me. Uh, so now, it's, if we go down now to specifics uh, about QMC pack, so by far the linear method is the recommended choice. It's very stable. We have used this, I think we all use this. I'm not sure anybody uses the, the old methods. It's stable uh, and it seems to, to work well for all the problems that we have used. Uh, of course, there are harder problems to optimize if you have parameters that are very different from each other, then the scale of, of the, 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 the scale of, I mean, moving these parameters, if you have a linear parameter on your anti-symmetric wave function and a just throw exponent on the three body, these two parameters have hugely different magnitudes and the gradients of the, of the energy with respect to these parameters are very different, of course. One is in the exponent and the other one is not. So there are some cases that are harder to optimize, but even on the hardest cases, the algorithms typically work robustly. Yeah. Uh, you kind of need to know a little bit what to, to, to tune, which is the negative side, but hopefully once you go through a few of the harder examples, you know how to do this and, and it becomes fairly straightforward. So going back, this is a simple flow chart of what a optimization algorithm is, uh, what an optimization process is in QMC. So we start, uh, with some initial guess for what the wave function is. This in practice means uh, the just draws are typically set to zero, and if you have a, an anti-symmetric wave function coming from a mean field calculation, then whatever that mean field wave function is. And so we always start, this is the core of the optimization step, we always do a VMC calculation to generate a, a set of samples that are going to be used to evaluate the matrices that I described before. And then, so, so these, you get to control here how many samples you want to generate to do the optimization calculation on. So, of course, the, the more samples you use, the smaller the, the error bars, and the more stable the optimization algorithm becomes. Uh, of course, the cost grows linearly with the, with the number of samples. So, so there is a, a little bit of a judgment call here. It usually is something that once you have done this a few times, you get a pretty good feeling. And I'm gonna say a few things about how I tend to decide this uh, later on. And so once you do this, effectively the code runs a standard VMC calculation and dumps to a file 
how many samples, whatever number of samples you requested. It's typically on the tens of thousands. If you want to be really careful and do benchmarking level calculations, then this number might have to be increased to hundreds of thousands. But again, I mean, we, even on big solids, this, this step is not quite expensive. It's not as, the expensive step. Once you generate the samples, then you go into the actual optimization step. The first step, effectively, the code will read back all of these configurations and would do whatever method you request. It might be the linear or the steepest descent on this set of configurations. Uh, it would uh, calculate the direction among which it's going to do the, op the linear optimization. Uh, it can be, again, typically we, we recommend the linear method. And, and then it's going to try to take a step along this direction you, using either rescaling the quadratic fit or the actual line, direct line minimization along this direction. So you get the choice to stay here with the same set of configurations and just redo this step several times. You have to remember that because this is a highly nonlinear problem, you have to, whatever you do has to be iterative. There is no one step solution. This is not a question of noise, this is just a question of having a highly nonlinear function. So you get to decide if you stay internally, which I guess is this loop right here. Once you're done with one step, you can iterate without regenerating a new set of samples. Or you get, or you can also, so you can do this any arbitrary amount of times, or you can actually go back and regenerate the, the set of samples that you, you, that, that, that you use to actually do the calculation. In other words, you get to go back and redo the VMC calculation at every step, of course, is with your current set of parameters. And the whole point is that uh, depending on the system, uh, the, the code gives you the freedom to, to determine the frequency of, of these two loops. Uh, this, this is a little bit of a, of a personal choice, to be honest. I tend to personally never re-loop with the same set of configurations. I, I always basically go back and regenerate my VMC configurations, but I have a lot of computing time, so I, I get to do that. <laughs> if you don't, then, then you, you get to play a little bit with uh, which of the two choices. At the end of the day, uh, it's going to converge. It's, we're only talking about efficiency at this point. And, uh, OK, and then when you're done, basically, you, you, you can move on to do DMC or whatever method you want to, to use the optimized wave function on. Um, this is a, I don't know how much of GMC pack input files you have seen already, but this is a standard XML block for optimization. I was actually having this discussion uh, a few minutes before. The, although we should actually have all the defaults be this, we, we don't actually. And, and this is a just a not having enough time to think these things through properly. We actually have a default XML block, which is very close to this one, uh, although there's discussions about small tweaks. But effectively, if you use this XML block, and I'm going to go through what each of these things are, you should be able, with small changes, converge basically most problems. Uh, the real thing should be, all of this should be the default, and then you have small changes. So, so we might actually do that in the future. But regardless, uh, so this up, up here uh, defines your, the VMC calculation that generates the samples. So you get to define how many blocks your VMC calculation is going to have, how many steps you throw away. And if, if you haven't gone through this yet, I, you might have done this in one of the labs. If not, you're going to certainly do this later today. The, the way that the code is structured, it divides the simulation into blocks. Every block is divided into steps, and every step is divided into sub-steps. There's a very clear reason why. So block means we output things to disk, we do com and we do you know, expensive things at the block level. So the, the, the only thing that the block does is effectively it stops the simulation to write things to this. And because this can be a fairly slow process, we, you don't necessarily have to do this as frequently. Steps, during the steps, we collect uh, statistics. We write samples. We do things that are not quite as low as, as writing to this. Actually, we do write to this, I have to say. But anyway, the whole point of, of stepping is to, uh, to set the frequency of sample collection and statistics and stuff like that. Uh, so during a step, the local energy, for example, is evaluated. And the, all the information about the walker is updated. This is a fairly expensive process if you're doing VMC. During a sub-step, 
the log, depending on the algorithm that you choose, but if, if you use uh, the standard algorithm, the local energy, for example, is not updated, you don't need the local energy to do variation of Monte Carlo. You just need to evolve your, wave, your, your walkers, which only require typically either the wave function or the gradient. So uh, the reason why I, typic I tend to suggest this type of, of setting is because you want to decorrelate as much as you can with the fastest possible algorithm. This, again, becomes, at the end of the day, we're only talking about efficiency. This is not gonna really change the result. Uh, but effectively, what I tend to do is I, I decide how many blocks I need to write the amount of samples, and then I decorrelate in between writes as much as I think I need to. So certainly, you want to do, you, you want to, you don't want to write out samples every step of a VMC calculation because then the, 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 there gonna be a, there's going to be a very high correlation between the different snapshots of your simulation. And what you want is to generate a sample that hopefully represents the full average over the full, distribu over the full wave function, the full distribution. So you want to get samples that are as decorrelated from each other as, as you possibly can. And you typically do this by just doing, by spreading out by some number of of steps, the, the right, uh, effectively the sample collection process, which is what you're doing here. So you get to set the time step of the VMC simulation, and you get to decide how many samples you want to collect in the VMC calculation. There are, I'm gonna say more than one way of setting out ex the samples, and you're gonna learn about a slightly different way. You can, you can we can talk about it later, but there's, there's some way to set in exactly how many samples you want. So in this case, setting samples to 10,240, that you're gonna have that number of any, any, any quantity that's used in the subsequent optimization algorithm becomes an average over the 10,000 samples that you generated in this VMC. Then you get to set up your cost function uh, of course, and, and the code doesn't know about units, so it's just gonna make a linear combination based on, on these quantities. It doesn't have to sum up to one, it just makes my life easier, I guess, but it can, it's just gonna take numbers, right, and make a linear combination. So this is what I suggest. Uh, again, you can, you, can, you can change this as you want. Uh, you're gonna have some amount of energy then there is a difference between reweighted and unreweighted variants, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, but if you have questions, we, I, I can, we can go into that in private later. But effectively, this is just a, a slightly different way of evaluating the variance. So the reweighted variance is the correct variance once you do reweighted, at a reweighted evaluation. Uh, if you drop the weights that I had on this equation, uh, you, you might decide to evaluate the variance and just drop these weights, assume that these weights are one. And, and, and that's what we call the unreweighted variance. And what you can show that the statistical noise on the unreweighted variance is a lot less if you try to move far away. But then it stops being a good measure of quality once you move far away because it's not the real variance anymore. So uh, I don't tend to use it. There's some codes like Casino that kind of some of their default optimizers are on underweighted variants. Uh, so it's, it's up to you. We, it's a choice that you can make and, and, and the code would do whatever you want. And then of course you have the optimization parameters. Um, okay, this gets tricky because some of the parameters are, 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 are deep into the actual algorithm. So I'm just gonna briefly mention what some of these are and let me skip forward. Yes, so I do say something about it. So um, I'm not sure how to do this best. Let me very quickly. Okay, so there are some of them that are simple. I, I, this is the, these are the ones that if you send me an email and you ask me for a, an XML, what XML block do I use? Anytime I do a calculation, I have this somewhere and I grab this thing and I throw it on the input file. So this is what I would give you. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of the important parameters. Some of them are here, some of them are not. So uh, this, is, this is somewhat boring, but this is crucial if you're actually going to do calculations yourself and you want to become a guru at parameter optimization, if you really want to be able to optimize anything. Uh, so big change, once every time that you, you do your solve your linear method and you decide on your direction and you're gonna take a step, big change is the largest possible step that you can make. So the default is usually fairly large, it's, it's usually too large. And, and the reason is when you start from a really bad wave function, the first few steps that you want to take are typically large so that you can converge 
very quickly to the neighborhood of the optimized energy. But once you are close enough, then you really don't want to allow very big changes. The big changes typically come because you have instabilities on the matrix inversion problem in the linear method. So if the number of samples is not big enough, you might get unlucky and get a somewhat unstable solution and your energy wants to, for example, shoot up. So this would prevent it from happening. There are, there are many fail safes in the algorithm that don't actually prevent, that don't actually allow you to do one of these bad steps. It's not so frequent, but if you do enough KMC, you will see these things one, from, from time to time. So there are two other ones that are coupled together. One is use buffer, and in the other one is non-local PP. So non-local PP means uh, if it's a question of whether you want to include the non-local energy into the optimization process or not. Uh, I haven't, we haven't discussed what the non-local energy is, so uh, you know, once we do, you're gonna understand what this is, and it's a question of whether we include that into the optimization or not. This, this has historical reasons. It took a while for, for the methods to become stable enough so that this can be done easily, but, but now it can. You know? so, so if you have an unlocal pseudo-potential, uh, then you should always, you should have yes, and this should work well. Use buffer is something historically related to multi-determinants. Uh, so there's a lot of information. Once you're doing the VMC calculation, most of the information that you need to evaluate the derivatives is already there for you in the VMC calculation. So you might, if you turn on the buffer by saying yes, it will basically store all this information so that when you read the coefficients, the configurations back, you don't have to reevaluate all of these things. The code works regardless of what you do. It is just faster if you store all of this information. Of course, if you're doing a really big calculation, you're gonna run out of memory. So at some point, the buffer is just not, you just don't have enough memory to store the information. But for most calculations, especially molecular problems, then it's a good idea to turn on the buffer if you're doing multi-determinant calculations. If you turn on the non-local energy, you should probably also turn on the buffer. And I don't know if we fixed that, actually. So there used to be a bug at some point. Anyway, so the mean method is, is one of the more important tags. It decides what algorithm you use to go down the down the hill effectively once you have decided on an optimization algorithm. So, so the default is Quartic because it actually works very well for most wave functions. So if you're doing solid state calculations where we typically only optimize a Jastrow, it works extremely well. If you do calculations where you only have, for example, configurations on this later determinant, it works very well. It tends to fail when you have very long multi-determinant wave functions combined with very complicated jastros, mostly because the scale of these two parameters are, are so different, they're orders of magnitude differences. So then the quartic method is, is probably not the method of choice, but for most calculations it is. You should always just try it, and, and if you see stable optimization, then you, and that's good. If you see problems with the optimization, uh, then typically the, the, the first thing to do is then to switch quartic to line mean, which is, line minimization. In this case, you are going to use the, I think this sort of golden rule algorithm to locate the minimum, if I recall correctly. But effectively, it, it's guaranteed to converge to the minimum. If the wave function is very, very, very complicated, it might still be that it's so nonlinear that you get to take very small steps. But in practice, this is not the case. So step size is directly related to mean method, and it determines in the quartic method, it determines the, the, the step that gets bracketed to do the fit of the polynomial. So it takes the, it's the other endpoint of the polynomial. And in the line mean method, it, it also, you, have to, you, you sort of assume that this step brackets the minimum. So it's gonna do a, a, a binary search on a bracket defined by this size, uh, typically. If the, if, if the bracket is too small, then it's just gonna walk all the way to the other end of the bracket, and it's just gonna take that step length. Uh, that's, that's a step size of this size. Allow difference is just what it is. So if, if for some reason the energy wants to go up, you abort, I mean, you abort any iteration where the energy goes up by whatever amount you put in here. So I tend to, to have something like 10 to the minus four here. And if for some reason the algorithm wants to do a step where the energy goes up, you effectively throw that calculation away and you redo the calculation with a fresh set of uh, configurations. Um, X zero, somewhat tricky too. So when you're solving the inversion problem in the linear method, you have to invert the matrix. This matrix has noise. Uh, 
And so if the noise is too large, this inversion is unstable. You can show that by adding a contribution to the diagonal, you can stabilize the inversion process. And the bigger this diagonal is, the, the, the more the direction rotates to steepest descent. So in the limit of an infinite diagonal, so basically this, the, this exponent 0 determines, so we add e to the this value to the diagonal every time we want to do the inversion process. The default is effectively at nothing, it's an extremely small number. And it works very well if you're doing, for example, if you don't mix parameters that are too different. If you're, if you're doing solid state calculations, then this default works very well and this default works very well. Again, it's only when you're really trying to optimize the more complicated wave functions that then you have to be paying attention to what this is. I personally set this to something like 10 to the minus 6. And so you add something to the diagonal, but it's not much. And the algorithm, actually, the code has actually a, a way of trying different values of the diagonal addition until it finds something that it's stable. And, and that gets said by end stabilizer and stabilizer scale. So what it will do in this case, the default is 3, for example. If I start with 10 to the minus 16, it will try to do a, an optimization step with this parameter. If it fails, it's going to try again for three times, and every time it would add 2 to the diagonal. In principle, you can set a very large number. And effectively, it would keep trying until it finds a successful step. Uh, and it would redo the calculation three times, and it would take the best, the lowest energy out of the three attempts. And so, so with this algorithm, you always get something. The worst case scenario is that you have to try a lot of times before you actually add something to the diagonal that stabilizes the algorithm, which is why I never tend to start at something as small as 10 to the minus 16. Uh, something like 10 to the minus 6 works for me. But again, this depends very much on the type of calculations that you do. If you do Again, standard solid state calculations, then, then this almost always works very well. Is all of this advice written down somewhere? Uh, yes, it's now on the documentation. So we have a description like this. Actually, all of this is going to end up in the documentation, and we have examples, uh, hopefully diverse enough. So it's, it's all on how much. If you, if you really request it, we're going to do all of these things. Uh, if you don't, then then. We'll see. <laughs> but certainly, all of this is going to be in the documentation. And if it really gets to the point where it's just too complicated, I mean, I've spent years doing this. So for me, I know exactly what to do. If it becomes too complicated, then please let us know. And the more you request it, the more we understand that this is required, and the more we're going to put information out there to make your lives easier. Like I said, I, once you understand the different knobs that you have to, to, to move around, you can optimize anything. Uh, so it's just a matter of understanding the three or four crucial ones. So if, if I want to summarize, basically, I have enough experience that I can kind of tell whether quartic or line mean, whether line mean is required. If line mean is not required, quartic is good enough. Then the defaults for step size allow difference are usually good enough, and the same with stabilizer. So I always think about whether I change this and whether this requires changing. Uh, if you want to have something default that tends, seems to always work, but it's not necessarily the most efficient one, then line mean with something like 10 to the minus 6, you know, this should probably optimize most things. And then the final thing is, is max ITS, which is what I mentioned before, is related to, to this inner loop, effectively. That is how many iterations you're going to do internally without, re, re, without changing the set of samples. So you get to set whatever you want, typically, uh, the, the default is one. You regenerate samples every time because the VMC calculation is really not the bottleneck at all of the calculation. So if, if you regenerate it, it's not really a big thing. Uh, there are two there are other parameters that are, uh, that, that are used. Uh, mean walkers, this is related to the correlated sampling. So if you try to take a step that's too far, the code keeps track of the effective number of walkers in the calculation. So in other words, if you have 1,000 walkers and your resampling efficiency is 50%, then you really has, have only 500 walkers. So if you try to become too aggressive or if the wave function is complicated, the effective number of walkers is going to drop very quickly as you move away from where you are. So this is a way of telling the code effectively, don't, once you detect that the effective number of walkers is 30%, just stop the calculation there and keep the parameter, basically keep the, the best parameters within this range and, and stop and circulate because currently you have moved 
too far away from this set of parameters that you had. And, and then max weight is, is a small thing. It actually kills any walker that, whose weight becomes too big. And, and this can happen if your value of the, if the value of your wave function and the current uh, configuration is very small. When you divide by a small number, the weight can explode. So effectively, you try to kill any walkers from taking over the configuration set. So these are small things. This, I frankly, I haven't changed in years, to be honest. Very rarely, you have to be doing something very hard to have to go and change this. And so this is my recommendation. And I actually doubt that this is the way other people do calculations. So setting the number of samples can become somewhat annoying, to be honest, uh, because every thread and every process writes samples every time you take a step. So figuring out exactly how many samples you get at the end of the day might be somewhat annoying. So this is my, the way I do it. I, OK, I really shouldn't even say recommendation. I'm just saying this is the way I do things. So I always do one step with some amount of soup steps to the correlate. And then I calculate the number of blocks based on the number of samples that I need. Because I know that at every step, I'm going every thread and every, basically every thread and every process is going to output, is going to contribute a walker. So I know how many walkers I'm contributed to the pool every time I, I take a step. So I decide how many samples I want. I divide samples by the number of threads, and that gives me the number of blocks that I need to generate so many samples because I'm doing only one step. There is an alternative way of doing this, and I'm not sure. I think somebody else might discuss this. There's a tag, steps between, samples between steps. Anyway, I'm just going to say what I do, and, and I'm leaving there. But if you have questions or if this becomes confusing, then ask any of us, and we can certainly make this better. And yeah, anyway, go ahead. Uh, so the total number of VMC steps when we're generating configurations is uh, the steps times samples. So at the end of the day, sub steps times samples. So every step you're gonna you're gonna stop, and every thread is going to generate a sample, right? So. The, the, number, the total number of steps is whatever you set the steps to multiply by the number of blocks. Because a block is going to do, so if I set steps to 10, for example, then I'm going to have 100 steps, really, because it's 10 steps per block multiplied by 10 blocks. So a, a block is a, how many steps you, you ask for, effectively. So if you set steps to 1, which is the way I tend to do it because it makes my life easier, I know that every thread is going to output 10 walkers because I'm doing 10 blocks, effectively. So I figure if I want to do 128 processors, 128 threads, for example, if I do 10, I'm going to take, I mean, 1,280 samples. Uh, you might chirp. Yeah. So I, I just mentioned that, of course, the code does print out the number of samples right, that are right. going to be. So we're going to do some initial QMC runs this afternoon, and so this will become clearer. But in general, you know, the first time you set up a system, you want to check the output of the code and make sure things like the number of samples are going and make sense, right? If you've forgotten, oh, I'm actually running on 32 threads on this system and not eight where I copied the input file for, all, you're going to see a different number. So it always makes sense just to eyeball the output the, the yeah. first time you do a run on a, on a system. And you catch this very quickly because the code is going to be either a lot faster or a lot slower than you're expecting. So there is a, there's an alternative way that I should say. So if you just set samples and you don't set steps, the code will determine how many steps you need to generate that number of samples. But if you, uh, which is probably the, the simplest way to do this, you don't really have to think about it. But then if, if you don't really have a perfect division between the number of threads and, and the number of samples, then it's going to do more steps that you need. Because then the last step, not everybody's going to write. So this is the way that I found to make sure that I do the minimum amount of effort possible. But it's not the simplest. So that's what I'm saying. This is, this is probably not the way. If you want to do a thousand calculations, then you probably want to do the automatic thing and just be careful. But you should be aware that there are two different ways of generating samples, and you should always look at the output to make sure that what you, re what you thought would happen is what's actually happened. And it's very simple. There's, there's, you know, it, the, the printout is very straightforward. You can just see exactly how many samples were generated. 
Okay, so we're, it's already 12, and it's good because this is the last slide. I just want to, to take some examples from the literature in how well this actually works. So this is straight out of the original paper by Cyrus, who's, I mean, Cyrus and Sandro, Cyrus Umrigar from Cornell and Sandro Sorella from uh, CISA are probably the, the two people who really work the most at, t at narrowing down on the linear method and making it what it is right now. Of course, there are 20 years of history, you know, going from, from David to, to a bunch of people who really did a lot of work. So that should also be mentioned. But effectively, this is the type of, this is what you should expect when you do calculations. If you take, for example, the carbon dimer, it's a simple uh, molecule. Uh, Effectively, you start up here with an un unoptimized wave function, and you can show that the linear method converges actually quite quickly. Uh, in their particular case, I, I don't quite remember how many uh, walkers they were using. They were using fairly large samples to do the optimization because you can see that the error bars, the oscillation between step to step is actually very small. And uh, so you can, you can I, I think they're optimizing everything, actually, in this case. They're optimizing the orbitals that go into the slater determinant, they're optimizing the exponents on the basis set, and they're optimizing probably 100 or so parameters on the different jastros. They have probably one, two, and three body jastros. So, so this is quite an ambitious optimization of, of the carbon dimer. And still, you can see that the, the linear method is just quite stable. Uh, it, it typically gives you there within 10 op uh, uh, iterations, I would say. Simple problems, if you do a, like a simple solid and you just want to optimize a gesture, I mean like four iterations and you're almost always there. Uh, depends on how complicated, again, the wave function is. Uh, and then not only that, so the, he's showing uh, also in his paper, so a lot of us have, have done this, so this, this sort of plot has become standard, I would say, in the field, where if you now expand your anti-symmetric wave function into a linear combination of determinants, then you end up with hundreds and thousands of these parameters that you have to optimize in the presence of all of the parameters in the JASTRO. And you can show how effectively the optimization at the VMC level, you just stably gain energy as you keep increasing the number of determinants, which is reflected by this. So up here, it actually tells you how many configuration stage functions you're using, and you just effectively recover the energy nicely as you come back. I mean, the fact that this can be done stably and, and like this is, is actually a, a big uh, sh uh, sign of success for the, for the linear method. Um, 10 years ago, b before the linear method appeared, it was quite hard to, to actually do this. And you can see how the, more, the better the VMC wave function is, the, the better the DMC also gets. And so right now we can probably optimize you know, 10,000 parameters, fairly straightforwardly, I would say. And the, also, the good thing is that like I said, there are one or two parameters that you have to be aware of, but if you know how to set them, it becomes robust and quite automatic. I mean, now I tend to do calculations and not really worry at all about optimization. There's very little human intervention. These things can be scripted and the, the, the machine does everything for you. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of paper, so I think you have copies to these slides. If you want to know a little bit about the important papers that led to the current state of wave function optimization, you can you can look at, at these things. Uh, you know, people like Claudia Filippi and Cyrus Umrigard and Sandro Sorella have been really at the forefront of, of getting this done. But you can see that once the linear method appeared in 2008 in its final form, very little has been done because the method is actually quite good. And I think that this is my last slide, apparently. So if you have any questions, I would gladly answer it. Okay, you understood everything, awesome.